Welcome to today's webinar co-hosted by Urban Catalyst and Wealth Channel. I'm Jimmy Atkinson, founder of Wealth Channel, and I'm joined today by Eric Hayden, founder and CEO of Urban Catalyst. I'm going to bring on Eric in just a minute here, but just a couple of quick announcements before we officially get going. Uh, please note that the contents of today's presentation should not be considered investment advice or tax advice. Please consult with an advisor before making any investment decisions. Uh, Eric, you're going to dive into a formal presentation on Urban Catalyst, your platform, what you're doing inside of your Opportunity Zone Fund 2, but also your brand new non-OZ, Urban Catalyst Multi-Equity Fund, uh, which can accept funds from retirement accounts and, and IRAs in particular. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about that. But, but to get us started, I just had a few questions for you that I wanted to ask you um, to highlight you as a thought leader, because you are a thought leader uh, in the OZ space, in the broader private equity real estate industry, and, and in particular, in the area of the country where you're located in, in beautiful Silicon Valley. So let me ask you a question about Silicon Valley to start us off. Uh, throughout the US, obviously, the real estate market is generally down. It's been kind of a tough last year or two. Um, and in particular, that pertains to office, uh, especially in, in the wake of the, the COVID pandemic, which shut down offices all across the country throughout 2020 and, and much of 2021 in, in certain areas of the country as well. How is Silicon Valley faring though? Real estate is so local, locally in Silicon Valley where you are, how is real estate faring? Sure. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, the market has been a little bit down the last year and a half or so. Uh, Silicon Valley has fared somewhat similar to the rest of the country overall. Although, as you mentioned, local markets are a little bit different. So it's faring slightly differently. And kind of the two big things, uh, and especially as it pertains to office, is our economy has remained relatively strong. I mean, Silicon Valley, we have Google, Facebook, Apple, and a host of midsize and startup companies. Um, we're still receiving venture capital funding. I think this year we received 42% of all venture capital funding um, in the country, which is a new high uh, by percentage. So things are still happening here, but uh, that's kind of like the positive news. The, the negative news is that because tech workers have more ability to work from home, we've seen a slower return to the office here than almost anywhere else in the country. And it's kind of been an interesting impact, right? Because people have been reading about, you know, Google coming back to the office three days a week, Apple. In fact, most of the big tech companies are now coming back three days a week and, and some of them too. But when you see that, what you know is that everybody's coming in on Tuesday or Wednesday or Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, folks are still going to need just as much office space as they needed before because all the people are coming in on the same day into the same buildings. Uh, at the same time, in 2021, we had one of the best years in Silicon Valley history. I mean, it might have been the best year in Silicon Valley history where we had new records for total dollars of venture capital funding. We created, you know, 90 plus new unicorn companies, you know, private companies valued over a billion dollars. We had more companies go public here than any other year going all the way back to the dot com. So 2021 was amazing. Um, these tech companies, they hired so many people in 2021. I mean, you might read about, oh yeah, tech companies are laying people off right now. Uh, in total, they laid off less than 10% of the people that they hired in 2021 alone. Hmm. So what I know is that these companies have hired so many people that they need more office space. But the decision makers that lease new office space for these groups, they've been somewhat reluctant to pull the trigger. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, kind of at that level. And so we haven't seen significant new leasing or acquisition from those companies for uh, properties. And because of that, uh, the office market in Silicon Valley is kind of similar to the rest of the country where it's kind of lagging. And then of course, interest rates, and I'm sure we'll talk more about interest rates, but interest rates have not uh, helped the overall situation. No, definitely not. I, I want to talk more about office with you in, in a few minutes, Eric, because I know uh, as a result of the office market, you've made a change to uh, the plans for your Opportunity Zone Fund 2, which was to include quite a bit of office space. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but but you brought up interest rates. Uh, obviously, a very steep rise 
in interest rates over the past 12 to 18 months. It's kept a lot of developers and lenders on the sidelines. Capital markets are really tight. Uh, finding sources of debt has been much more difficult. Why do you think most developers and lenders are waiting it out right now besides the increased cost of money? Well, uh, it's kind of a, a perfect storm, right? So we have this increased cost of money, which by itself does not really make your project uh, have a, that big a different return, right? So you know, if I have a $100 million building and I have an extra $5 million in interest, that isn't going to make or break your project. But what ends up happening is, is, a, is a couple of things. The first is lenders do their underwriting and they want to be really conservative as to when you build your building and you go to get your permanent financing. They want to make sure that there is a loan that's going to be able to take out their construction loan. And because over the last you know, year, year and a half, interest rates have been rising, lenders have been building in a buffer for that takeout loan, assuming that interest rates will continue to rise. Uh, because of that, when they work their way backwards through the math using, you know, debt yield and debt service coverage ratio, instead of getting your typical, call it 65 to 70 percent loan to cost when you go to build your building from a senior debt provider, uh, we're seeing closer to 50 percent. When you see 50 percent, that requires significantly more equity to put into your project. So if you had anticipated you're going to put in, you know, say like just for example, we have a hundred million dollar building. Uh, you anticipated you're going to get 65 million from a bank, and then you were going to put 35 million in. Uh, now you have to put in 50 million. That lowers your return. That's why folks use leverage when they build buildings, is because it increases their returns. Now they don't want to use too much leverage because that's when you get into kind of like too much risk. But ever since 2008, you know, 65 percent has kind of been the bellwether for both um, for both. Uh, construction loans and uh, takeout loans. So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is, well, okay, so you need more equity. So you, what you should do is go out, raise more equity in your fund, or find a partner, you know, a third-party equity provider that wants to come into your project and you know work as your partner to build the building. So we've also seen the third-party equity market dry up almost completely. And that started during COVID. During COVID, everybody was unsure about the future. They didn't really know what it was going to mean. So what they did is they just kind of put everything on pause. Coming out of COVID after an awesome 2021, we saw the equity groups kind of thaw out uh, in early 2022. And we started projects starting to get financed. And that happened until about June of 2022. And then that door just closed. And it has not opened. In fact, it's gotten worse and worse to the point where there's almost no equity available for any asset classes. Uh, the final thing that has happened was, you know, Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank, you know, Silicon Valley Bank going down, First Republic getting acquired by Chase. Those are both Silicon Valley banks, but that doesn't make a huge impact on us that they're here in Silicon Valley. What really makes the big impact is that what we saw was some pretty well-off mid-sized banks you know, have some real serious issues. The federal government doesn't like that. You know, they didn't like it in 2008 when big banks went down. They did the Dodd-Frank Act. They did all sorts of stuff to make it harder to get a loan on your house, made banks carry more liquidity in order to, you know, have a better resistance to downturns. That was all well and good. They're doing a very similar thing because of what happened to uh, both First Republic and Silicon Valley Bank. And what they're doing is they're, hoping to consolidate mid-sized banks to you know make them larger so they're you know strongly encouraging them to have some mergers and acquisitions occur they're also uh, putting so much pressure on them from a regulatory standpoint that a lot of banks are reluctant to do what's called syndications syndications that's when you know let's say a mid-sized lender their maximum loan amount is 25 million and say I want to go out and get an 80 million dollar loan well, usually your lead syndicate would say, this is great. We're going to underwrite you. We're going to make this happen. Then we're going to go out to three or four other banks and they'll each put in 25 million too. The syndication market has completely dried up. So that makes it so that most of the mid-sized banks are not available to give senior debt. And or at least in the amounts that we're looking for here at Urban Catalyst, where our smallest project is, you know, in the 90 to $100 million range. Uh, so, it has been a lot more challenging to find debt and almost impossible to find equity 
And so when you see that happen, what you see is you see a lot of people on the sidelines that may want to start their projects, but they're unable to start their projects. So I wouldn't really say the developers are waiting. It's they're forced to wait. Right. Yeah, no, that's a great, great insights. There a great breakdown of, uh, of, uh, of why <laughs> developers are forced to wait. Um, but how has it affected you and Urban Catalyst, though? It, it, has it impacted your projects at all, or are you guys still full steam ahead? Or I, I'm you know, curious. the good thing to know is that all of our projects are good projects, right? When we purchased the land and we got all the approvals for all of our projects, we know in our models that it pencils. Uh, right now, it's just a very challenging financing market. And the way that it's affected us is we have had some delays uh, on the starts of some of our projects. So we've combat that in a couple of different ways. The first is, you know, we started a um, $100 million hotel project in January of this year, really going against the grain where we're not seeing a lot of projects start, but we were able to start one. Uh, we got 50% loan to cost to build that building. And then we funded it with our equity. And so solution to no third-party equity, fund it with your own equity. Yeah. So that's what we did for that project. Um, today, you know, we're going to talk about our UC Multifamily Equity One LLC, which is our IRA to Roth IRA conversion um, benefits uh, for that fund. And that fund in particular was set up to be the third-party equity for one of our Opportunity Zone Fund One projects. So again, if there's no other third-party equity available and you need more equity because there's less debt available, uh, raise your own equity. So that's what we're doing for that project as well. So we're, we're taking strides like that to make our projects uh, you know, come out of the ground. But uh, in a lot of cases, we're like most developers where we're waiting on the financial markets to improve because not only... Um, not only will that allow us to start our projects, but we'll have way better terms on our projects when we start them. And usually that makes them more profitable. Very good. Uh, well, we're talking about tax advantage real estate investing today. You have a couple of really unique opportunities. One is an Opportunity Zone fund, as we've mentioned. Uh, for anybody who's new to Opportunity Zone investing, Eric, I think you're going to give at least a, a high level overview of, of what a couple of the benefits are for Opportunity Zone investors who bring in deferred capital gains into a qualified opportunity fund such as yours. But, but then you also have this newer product, this non-OZ product, um, which can essentially act as a Roth IRA conversion vehicle. I'll let you get into that in a minute here. I did want to get back to the topic of office and the slumping demand for office. Uh, originally, your OZ fund two was scoped to have uh, just two buildings, Icon and Echo, one uh, a multifamily building and the other an office building um, with, I can't remember how many hundred thousand square feet of office space, but you, you, you've you since recently announced that because of the slumping office market, you're converting that office into multifamily. Is that right? Can you, can you talk about that for a moment? Sure, absolutely. So um, in our Opportunity Zone Fund 2, which is our current offering, we're going to talk in a little more detail about that uh, during my presentation. But uh, that fund has four projects. One of the projects is a 500,000 square foot office. Uh, it's a beautiful building. Before COVID, you know, office was the highest and best use here in, in downtown San Jose. You know, we saw the Silicon Valley companies expanding southward in a really big way. Um, of course, COVID happened. Return to office didn't occur as anticipated. And now we have a project that's approved, but we kind of wonder not only from a when will office tenants come back into the market and start leasing, but also when will lenders feel more confident in office in general? Um, when you try to look into the future and everybody has their own crystal ball, you kind of wonder how many years will it be before office becomes a marketable product again? And what I know is that multifamily is a marketable product now. Um, you can build multifamily because there is a very strong demand here in Silicon Valley for housing. In fact, you know, California in general has a housing crisis. Uh, because of that very strong demand, we have made the choice that we're going to be switching our 500,000 square foot office building into around 650 units of multifamily. And it is going to take us a couple years to go back through uh, the planning process to get those approvals. It's not a significant risk for this project in general. Downtown San Jose is one of the best jurisdictions to work in 
uh, in all of California. And I know that because we just processed eight projects, big you know projects through downtown San Jose. And we went eight for eight with our approvals with pretty much exactly what we proposed when we first started. So that isn't so much of an issue. It's more of the issue of time. And if it takes us two years to get those approvals and then another year to create our construction documents before we can start construction, is it going to be faster and better for our fund investors to wait on office or to change the project that's going to take three years, but we know there's demand for it now. And it was really, I would say about 12 months ago, we started thinking about making this change. We wanted to see how office and the return to office continued. And as it did not pick up steam in any meaningful way, and with interest rates continuing to go up, it became pretty obvious to us that this change was the best move for our investors. Very good. Uh, well, that all makes sense. And uh, good luck to you to, to, to wait that out. I'm sure it'll be well worth it. Like you mentioned, um, the demand for multifamily seems to not be going anywhere. There's a housing shortage all over the country, but in particular in California, it seems rather steep, the housing shortage. Uh, Eric, that concludes our, our pre-presentation interview portion. So if you want to fire up your pitch deck, I know you've got a presentation to give on the Urban Catalyst platform and the different tax-advantaged investment opportunities that you have to offer, including your Opportunity Zone Fund, as well as your non-OZ multifamily equity fund, uh, which has some unique benefits of, of being able to accept IRA and other qualifying retirement account dollars. Eric, I see your screen. It looks good. So without further ado, please take it away. Sure. And, and Jimmy, before I get started, I did want to just kind of sum up our conversation a little bit. Please do. You know, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, real estate markets are cyclical and, you know, we always run into a downturn, you know, I think on average every seven years for like the last hundred years. So this is nothing new. This is nothing that we haven't seen before. Uh, for us here at Urban Catalyst, you know, our projects may have been delayed because of lack of financing options, but our real value add in these funds is when we build the buildings. That's really when we make the profits for our investors. And because we're Opportunity Zone Fund in general, our timeline is 10 years. It's a, it's a long-term fund. So uh, when you think about that, we're not that significantly affected by this downturn. It would be... Uh, it'd be a different story if we had a bunch of existing office buildings that we were trying to lease or something of that nature, but that's not where we are here in Fund 2. Um, also, you know, I've been a developer for a long time, and when 2008 happened, it, it kind of feels a little bit familiar, right? I, I lived through the 2008 recession that went through 2009 and 2010. I was in a very similar position to where a lot of our urban catalyst projects are now, which is we have great projects, we haven't started construction on them, and there's really no financing to get things started. Um, and what ended up happening was in early 2011, the equity markets came back online all at the same time. And when that happened, uh, I started all of our projects. And, you know, I was working for another company, but we had a bunch of projects, they all started. Those projects turned out to be some of the best and most profitable projects I've ever built in my entire career. Now, a part of that, of course, was we saw rents increase significantly between 2011 and 2018. So it was like we took advantage of the lower construction costs, starting construction in 2011 and 2012. And then we sold the buildings in 2018 to 2020. And that increase was so significant that we had amazing returns. Uh, I'm not saying that that's exactly how this is going to pan out. But uh, like I said, it feels very familiar. All right. So uh, with that, I'll start talking about the two offerings that we have. And thank you so much for the introduction, Jimmy. Uh, I'm going to start with Urban Catalyst Opportunity Zone Fund 2. Urban Catalyst Opportunity Zone Fund is structured a lot like a traditional real estate equity fund. We're focused on doing ground up development projects in downtown San Jose. You know, of course, we've been discussing here for uh, the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, just to kind of kick us off, you know, Urban Catalyst, I mentioned we have a lot of projects going on here in downtown San Jose, so we've been featured pretty prominently in the news. Uh, really just a lot of positive buzz about the projects we're creating. Um, 
we've been in over 250 news articles, but probably the most important of those, we were named by Forbes magazine as one of the top 20 opportunity zone funds in the country. So nothing like getting, you know, a little national validation from Forbes that we're doing things the right way. Uh, to talk about the opportunity zone, opportunity zone fund tax benefits just a little bit, the first thing that you have to know is that in order to be eligible for those tax benefits, you have to have a capital gains event and then invest that capital gains event or that capital gains money into a qualified opportunity zone fund. Uh, here are the three most common ways that folks have capital gains events. And then once you have that event, you have 180 days to put your money into a fund. We like to show this slide just to make sure everybody's aware that there is a timeline associated with it. So if you've recently sold some stock, you've recently sold your business, you recently sold the property, now is the perfect time to be talking about uh, how you can make investments into real estate and utilize some tax advantages. There are two major tax benefits associated with our program. The first, of course, is investors are able to defer paying capital gains taxes on their initial capital gains event until they pay their taxes in 2027. So you get to defer those taxes for a couple of years. Uh, the second one is a much better benefit, and that is after an investor's money seasons in our fund for 10 years, all of the profits from the fund itself are tax-free from a federal capital gains perspective. So... Uh, here at Urban Catalyst, of course, our plan, you know, we're going to build all these buildings, we're going to lease them up, stabilize them, hold them until we get to the end of that 10-year mark, and then we're going to sell the assets and liquidate the fund, and that's when we plan on returning the majority of the profits to our investors, and those profits are tax-free. Just taking a step back, here are the opportunity zones throughout the Bay Area, and obviously they're in green there, and obviously for this fund, we're focused on San Jose and even more specifically downtown San Jose. You can see uh, four opportunity zones cover almost all of downtown. You know, we really like the downtown San Jose market a lot. Um, we've been developers here for a long time doing business in Silicon Valley and uh, specifically in San Jose. And the reason we like San Jose so much is because it has all the components that we want to see when we do high density development anywhere. Uh, the first, of course, is the Silicon Valley job engine. You know, we want to make sure that there's a demand for all of the different types of projects that we're building. The next is, of course, we want to build in a place where transit and physical infrastructure already exist. And that's perfect. Uh, you know, downtown San Jose is really the only true urban environment in Silicon Valley. We've got Deardon Station, which is slated to be the largest train station on the West Coast. Um, it already has a variety of mass transit options that connect to it, including Caltrain, which gets you up to San Francisco in about an hour, and BART, which is the largest mass transportation system here in the Bay Area, is now fully funded to connect through downtown San Jose into Deardon Station. And then San Jose State University, you know, with over 36,000 undergraduate students, it's the second largest university in the Bay Area behind Cal Berkeley. So, and that's right in the heart of downtown. Finally, you know, we want to do business in a place where the local government wants to see development happen. You know, I, I mentioned it earlier, especially with the change of our office project into multifamily. You know, we have to go back through the planning process. Going back through the planning process in most California jurisdictions is quite a challenge but it's kind of the opposite here in downtown San Jose. In fact, you can see this picture. Uh, this is a picture of, of me and my partner, Josh. Uh, we're standing there with mayor of San Jose, Matt Mahan. He's put in a bunch of great policies, really streamlined the pre-construction process, making it so much easier for developers to do business down here. It's attracted a lot of developers to downtown. So uh, that is a, a thing that we definitely look for when we do development projects. To give everyone an idea of just what is happening here in downtown San Jose, I'd like to show this before and after slide. So this is the current skyline of downtown San Jose. If all of the projects that are currently in the planning process are built out, say, over the next 10 years or so, downtown San Jose should almost triple in size. And you can see Urban Catalyst projects, both our Opportunity Zone Fund 1 and Fund 2 projects there in red. To so continue talking about the local market, uh, we like to use this two-dimensional map. This black line here, this represents the opportunity zone. Uh, our headquarters is right here, so we're right in the heart of downtown San Jose. Uh, this is Adobe's World Headquarters. 
You know, Adobe has been in downtown San Jose for over 30 years. They just finished building their fourth high-rise tower right here, 1.3 million square feet. They occupied it with 3,000 employees. So uh, that was really fun for us to watch because I can look right out the window of my office and saw the construction all the way start to finish. Um, we're also right next door to Zoom's world headquarters. It's been it's been interesting watching Zoom. You know, they really took off during the pandemic, but of course they started uh, working from home, which made a lot of sense. But uh, recently, Zoom has been forced to come back into the office, and uh, we share a parking garage with Zoom, and all my employees have been complaining that there's nowhere to park. Um, we always thought it was kind of funny that if anybody was going to do that whole work from home for everything, it'd definitely be Zoom, but uh, nope, they're back in the office. Uh, here's San Jose State. This red dash line is where the new BART line is running. There's a station here in downtown, and then, of course, it connects into Deardon Station, the big train station right here. Kind of the biggest story in downtown over the last several years has been uh, Google's massive acquisitions. And I'll give you kind of the highlights. They've acquired $500 million worth of property, almost uh, 80 acres of land. Uh, their plans, which were approved a couple of years ago, show them building around 7 million square feet of office and 6,000 residential units. At Build Out, this will be Google's largest campus on earth. Um, Google says this is a 10 plus year, $19 billion build out. It's very exciting. Uh, Google started construction on their first phase at the end of last year. Uh, that was really the demolition and historic remediation of their first phase. Um, really, Google is excited about this project. They've you know, been reaffirming their commitments to downtown San Jose throughout you know, the pandemic and throughout this higher interest rate market. And really, it seems to us what they're up to right now is they're finishing off their second major campus in Sunnyvale. They've got a couple buildings left to build before they really turn their focus onto their third campus. So that's what Google's been doing. Um, of course, Google's not the only story in town. We've seen other major developers come into downtown over the last several years, including you know, Boston Properties, a big publicly traded REIT, uh, West Bank, a uh, international development group out of Toronto, Heinz, the largest development company in the country. And then Jay Paul, who's a regional developer, uh, has built projects all over the Bay Area, but just recently finished off 26 buildings in the city of Sunnyvale, just to our north. So um, always exciting to see Jay Paul making a big move into downtown. Um, here's some examples of those projects. And, you know, we're just talking about Jay Paul. He just finished this almost million square feet of office. Uh, it's one of the biggest buildings in downtown. It's absolutely beautiful. He's out there looking for a tenant right now. Oh, I mentioned Adobe. Isn't their project just really exciting? And then uh, one that we really should pay attention to, this is Miro Towers from Bayview Development, 630 um, apartment units. And um, this project is right across the street from our apartment projects uh, in Fund 2. So it's a really good comparable. I'll show you where it is on the map when we get there, but uh, uh, it's really nice to have the best project in town right across the street from your project so that you can you know, run your models utilizing them as uh, the best comparable. So you know, big developers, big tech companies have come into downtown. You know, we saw this wave of development coming because we're local developers. And our whole plan when we started Urban Catalyst was to acquire properties uh, before they were scooped up by all the other developers and big tech companies. And really, that's exactly what we did with the acquisition of our Fund 1 and Fund 2 projects. Uh, you can see Fund 1 projects in blue, Fund 2 projects in orange. Uh, Fund 2, our current offering, I mentioned two projects right next to each other, two apartment projects. That's right next to Miro Towers, which is located right here. It's right on the BART line. It's right on Santa Clara Street, which is really the call it the main drag of the central business district here in downtown. It's across the street from City Hall. It's really the epitome of transit-oriented development. And then we have two projects over here in downtown West. Uh, these are you know, 300 yards from Google's big mega campus. They're right next to the SAP Center, which is our big arena. It's located right here. Um, second most used arena in the country behind Madison Square Garden. So really great locations for our projects. Uh, and here's what our four projects look like. We have the Keystone Hotel, Gifford Place Senior Living, Echo Multifamily, 
And we have an icon office project. And as I mentioned, this is changing to multifamily and I'll show you uh, kind of the new rendering of what that's going to look like. But overall, you know, we wanted to have a diversity of asset classes in this fund. Um, and we achieved that by, you know, creating these different projects. I'm gonna go through each one, one by one, so we can kind of see, you know, what is happening with each project. First being the Keystone Hotel. Keystone Hotel is a Marriott. It's a Marriott Town Place Suites. That's an extended stay business hotel. And if you don't know what an extended stay business hotel is, it's a hotel where our average guest stays for 15 nights. So we have a lot of really long-term guests. Uh, each room has its own kitchen. Uh, Marriott has wanted to put a town place suites in downtown for quite a while now. We partnered with them a few years ago as uh, uh, we had this site and we knew that they really wanted to create a product like this. So we have our franchise agreement in place with them. Uh, we have a great operator for this project. And we started construction on this project at the beginning of this year. We knocked down all the buildings. Uh, now we're about halfway done with construction. Uh, this slide is a little bit dated because we're currently building out the framing on the sixth floor. It's an eight story building. We plan on completing construction at the end of 2024, so about a year from now. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, we have, because less development has been occurring in Silicon Valley over the last year, uh, we have all the best subcontractors and a, quite a few of them on site every day. And so they're actually going faster than schedule. And we're a couple million dollars under budget, which is also really nice. Uh, these are things that we really like to see when we build our projects. You know, uh, construction is all about schedule and budget. Right across the street from that project, we have Gifford Place. So this is also in downtown West, you know, right by Google's campus. Uh, this is our senior living facility, and even more specifically, it's assisted living and memory care. Um, depending on what year it is, you know, Silicon Valley and the San Jose metro area really uh, get good rankings when it comes to the best markets in the country for senior living. A lot of times we're first place with uh, the ranking of the best market in the country. And the reason for that is, you know, folks around here make a lot of money and we have an aging population and, uh, you know, people can just afford to put their parents and grandparents into facilities like this. Um, they haven't built a facility like this in downtown San Jose in over 40 years. So there's a lot of demand for this. Uh, uh, there's a lot of affluent areas in the surrounding communities where this would be a huge benefit for them to be able to put their parents so close to them. Uh, this project is shovel ready and we anticipate starting construction towards the end of next year as the financial markets warm up a little bit. Uh, but overall, just a great project. We've done several of these throughout our career and we've been very successful with them. Uh, we did break ground on this project last summer. Um, so we knocked down all the buildings. We're currently using it as the construction staging for the hotel project across the street. All right, on to Echo. Echo is our multifamily project. Uh, 388 units. And, you know, Icon and Echo are right next to each other. So here's Icon in its office form. Here is Echo as our apartment building. Icon, of course, is going to be changing to multifamily. In fact, here is what it looks like as a multifamily project. So in total, this will be around, um, this will be around 650 apartment units. This will be around 388 apartment units. And as I mentioned, right across the street, we've got uh, Miro Towers, uh, one of the best comparables out there. Uh, they finished construction about a year and a half ago. They're 85% occupied right now as they're leasing up. They're leasing up at 35 units a month, which is faster than the typically anticipated 20 units a month. And they have the highest rents in the city. So it's it's great to see them, you know, and the success that they're having because in general, we have slightly nicer floor plans than they do. And we have better amenity spaces, same location. Uh, we do think we will achieve slightly higher rents. However, um, we model our projects really right off of where their rents are. So, you know, let me kind of dive a little bit deeper into the multifamily market. I mean, earlier we talked about the housing crisis. Um, really here in Silicon Valley, what we see is that we've created six jobs for every housing unit that we've built for over 30 years straight. And that has caused us to have some of the most expensive housing in the country. I mean, just for example, uh, San Jose hit a new record last year with our median home price being 1.7 million. Uh, that makes us the most expensive big city 
to buy a house in in the entire country in the fourth most expensive big city in the world. So uh, very hard to afford a home. Still, we got all these tech workers. They make a lot of money. They can't, they still can't afford to buy a house. So they are forced to rent, but they want to rent a nice place. So a class A multifamily like Icon and Echo, great choice for them to move into. Um, a lot of the issues associated with supply and demand is not that we just create so many jobs. It's also that we just build less than almost any other major city in the country. And, and that's because when you think of cities like Atlanta or Dallas, you know, you can just continue to build outwards. It's flat for hundreds of miles. Here in Silicon Valley, it's a very small geographical area and we're constrained by mountains and water. So we're completely built out. So every time we build a new project, we're building infill. Infill is just more challenging in general than buying dirt. And then at the same time, if you're building infill, that means you already have neighbors and those neighbors complain to their elected officials that they don't want more traffic. They don't want people parking on their streets. Um, that makes local officials who are voted into office more reluctant to approve housing. Uh, this has caused us not to approve housing, not to build housing, and we build less housing than almost anywhere else. So you have kind of that perfect storm of we're generating so many jobs that people need to live here, but at the same time, we can't build housing. We build it slower than almost anywhere else. That's caused us to have the highest occupancy rates in the country. We have the third most expensive rents in the country behind San Francisco and New York. Um, and overall, it's a great market to build and own multifamily. So that's why we're choosing not only to build 400 units about of multifamily here, but 650 units next door in this, you know, amazing new building. You know, what makes Urban Catalyst different than most other opportunity zone funds out there is uh, we're not just fund managers, but we're also the developers. And we like to think of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, right? Because most other fund managers, you know, their whole plan for opportunity zones is to go out and raise a bunch of money and look all over the country to find you know, developers that have projects in opportunity zones, so they can form partnerships. You know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they go out, raise a bunch of money, and then hire someone to build them a computer. It's, no, they built a computer and then took it out to the market. And really, that's exactly what we're doing here at Urban Catalyst. We're not just the fund manager, but we're the developers of all of our projects. It allows us to do things, you know, like we've been talking about, converting an office building to multifamily. Also, you know, when we talk about the opportunity zone tax benefits or, you know, coming up here, we're going to talk about the tax benefits associated with IRA to Roth IRA conversions. Uh, you have to remember that it's the real estate that really matters uh, in opportunity zones, especially if you're looking at tax free profits, you know, there better be profits. So understanding the asset classes that are being built, who the developers are, they're building the projects and, you know, of course, the local market in general, that's what matters. Uh, to talk about us a little bit here before we get into our next fund, uh, Jimmy introduced me. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that again, Jimmy. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Urban Catalyst. I've been a developer my whole career. I've done several billion dollars worth of projects. In general, I build institutional quality and scale projects. And what that means is I build big income producing buildings with a typical exit strategy of selling to a publicly traded REIT or a large institutional investment group. I have five partners here at Urban Catalyst in total. Um, Josh and Paul are my two development partners. I've known them for 15 plus years each. Um, really experienced in doing development, especially here in San Jose and Silicon Valley. Uh, Josh is our chief operating officer. Uh, Paul is our head of development and construction. He now manages around 18 people that do all of our development and construction work. Um, Morgan Mackles, our head of investor relations. Morgan and I have been friends for over 25 years. We went to high school together. He was a groomsman at my wedding. Uh, it's always fun to work with your friends. He's the reason why we've been so successful in our fundraising for the variety of different funds we have here on the Urban Catalyst platform. And then Sean Raft. Sean's our chief administrative officer and general counsel. You know, obviously, he's an attorney. And of course, he manages all of our compliance with the SEC, with the Opportunity Zone rules and regulations. Uh, he also manages our accountants that do our tax and audit. Really easy way to say it, Sean, really dots the I's and crosses the T's here at Urban Catalyst. And combining just the five partners, we've done 
around $5 billion worth of ground up development projects here in Silicon Valley. And you can see the heavy concentration of projects we've done in downtown San Jose. So we've done a lot of business here. Uh, we kind of know how the local market works, which is why folks like local developers. Uh, now to go through the timeline for Opportunity Zone Fund 2. And I'll give you a couple of changes that are in the works of being made. But just in general, uh, three-year fundraise, we're raising $200 million. We've raised $140 million to date. More than likely, we're going to extend our fundraise by a year. So we hit that $200 million mark. Here's 2027. We flag this date because this is when you have to pay taxes on your initial capital gains spend. So it's important to remember. Here in 2034, this is when we plan on selling the properties after the 10-year hold. Now that more than likely will move out to 2035. But that's how folks get the tax-free profits when we liquidate the fund. We do plan on making distributions to investors prior to 2034. And those distributions should start from refinance events in 2026. You know, refinance events, pretty typical for ground up developers, right? We build the buildings, we lease them up, stabilize them. We go out, we get permanent financing, take the permanent financing, pay off the construction loan. And then if we have excess refinance proceeds, we distribute those to our investors. Um, our Keystone Hotel, which is already under construction, should be complete here in early 2025. And we do anticipate having a refinance event in 2026. Of course, it does depend on the markets as far as interest rates and a variety of other factors as to how much uh, or if there will be money to distribute to investors in 2026. But uh, of course, as time goes on, we start our other projects, we'll have future refinance events. They probably will push out past 2028, going almost out to 2031 with our final project now that we're making the switch from office to multifamily for iClean. We also have cash flow. Cash flow is really exciting. Of course, it's just we have stabilized assets. They have net operating income. We pay the debt service on our permanent loans and then excess cash as it builds up, we'll make those distributions to investors. Uh, one of the really interesting things about Opportunity Zone funds and our program is, of course, we're structured as an LLC, which means we give our investors a K-1. Our investors uh, should receive losses on their K-1 almost every year. And folks love losses on your K-1, so we'll be distributing you know, money from refinance, we'll be distributing money from cash flow, but you'll also get losses. Uh, losses primarily come, well, they come from a variety of factors, but one of the larger ones is from the depreciation of our stabilized assets. And you know, anyone that owns real estate, they typically depreciate their asset every year on their tax returns. Very similar for us, except we pass through that depreciation to our investors as passive loss. And we are anticipating to have more passive loss than cash flow. Now, cash flow is passive income. That means in certain cases, investors will be able to offset the passive income with passive loss, uh, which would make this cash flow tax free. And then finally, of course, you know, one of the things that real estate investors really don't like, and that is if you sell the building for more than you bought it for, you have to pay back all that depreciation you've taken. It's called depreciation recapture, uh, specifically for opportunity zone funds. And this is, of course, the good news is there is no depreciation recapture. So investors get to keep all those passive losses that we pass through. And then, of course, when we sell the property, you get the tax-free profits from a federal capital gains perspective. So kind of my... A you know, recap of how this works is we have tax-free refinance events because it's a distribution of debt. We have the potential for tax-free cash flow offset by passive losses, and then tax-free profits because of the Opportunity Zone program, and at the same time, no depreciation recapture. We also have bonus units in this fund, and we'll talk about bonus units in our other fund as well, but uh, it's pretty simple how this works. If you're investing in urban cattle, so what you're doing is you're buying our units. You're then paid out based upon the number of units that you own. We give bonus units in three different ways. The first is our time incentive credit. This is really to reward investors for earlier investment. You can see we're almost here in December, so we're almost out of bonus units. We do plan to uh, create bonus units for next year. It'll be very similar schedule to this. And bonus units for previous years of investors will be added uh, at the same rate. So you can say in December right now, it says zero, but more than likely it'll be 2.75%. Um, that means if you invested $100 into Urban Catalyst, you know, you bought $100 worth of units, we would give you $102.75 worth of our units here in December. Next up, our multiple ventures program. This is for folks that have invested into our other funds. It's really a loyalty rewards program. 
Then finally, our volume incentive program, our minimum investment size, 250,000 bonus units, sort of 300,000, go all the way up to 1.9 million. And then we add these columns together to get your total amount of bonus units. All right, so that's our Opportunity Zone Fund 2. Uh, if you're interested, of course, let us know. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about our UC Multifamily Equity One LLC. We like to call this fund UCME. Again, this fund structured a lot like a traditional real estate equity fund. We're focused on a single multifamily ground up development project in downtown San Jose. One of the really exciting things about this fund is, of course, we accept retirement accounts. And let me kind of talk about how all of this works, but let's start off with the basics IRAs versus Roth IRAs. So, uh, a lot of folks have IRAs, you know, they've already invested in them. And IRAs are great as a retirement account mainly because you don't have to pay taxes on the money that you put into your IRA. But after your IRA grows and you retire and you take out that money, you have to pay taxes when you take it out. Now, kind of the opposite is the Roth IRA, right? In the Roth, you don't pay taxes. I mean, sorry, the Roth, you pay taxes when you put the money in. So it's after-tax money that goes into that. But then when you retire and you pull the money out, it's grown tax-free for your entire life. So... A lot of folks prefer the Roth IRA to the IRA structure, but if you've already put money into an IRA and you say, want to do the conversion? Well, when you do the conversion, there's a problem. You have to pay taxes when you do that conversion, and that can take a pretty significant chunk out of your portfolio. But good news, there's a solution. The solution is investing into ground-up development projects with your IRA. The big thing that happens in ground development projects is we have a reduced valuation during construction. And let me tell you exactly how that works. So step one, of course, you invest your IRA into a fund like ours. Step two, the fund starts construction. Uh, when it starts construction, we get this lower valuation. We let everybody know. We tell the custodians. Uh, we tell all of our investors. So step three, uh, we make that notification. Hey. We're at what we think is the lowest valuation, and that allows investors to, on their own, do a conversion from an IRA to a Roth IRA. Uh, why we like that is because when you do the conversion, you have less to pay in taxes because you're paying on your current valuation. Uh, and then finally, you know, we build buildings because we expect them to be worth more at the time that we sell the buildings. We're going to build it and then sell it. When we sell it, we're going to exit more than likely at a higher valuation. Um, so a lot of people ask the question, well, how does this devaluation occur and why does it occur? And our explanation has always been uh, the J curve. And, you know, this happens in all of our funds that we do ground development. So this is happening right now in our opportunity zone fund, but here's how it should happen for this fund. However, this example is just an example. It is not a representation of our fund. So uh, it's kind of a typical example of how this works. So let's pretend an investor invests a dollar into a fund like ours. You know, there's some reasons why it devalues right before we start construction, but then it continues to really hit its bottom while we're under construction. It does that for a few reasons. First is, you know, investors are investing into a private equity fund. Uh, we're an LLC and those investors are limited partners. Because they're limited partners, they have little to no control over what happens at the fund. There's also no secondary market to sell your shares, so they have a lack of liquidity. Uh, both of those factors cause uh, a valuation to go down because it increases risk. Then when we start construction, we have what's called the lack of transferability. You know, if you're going to sell a, a, an existing building to someone, it's pretty straightforward. If you're selling a project that's under construction, you have these additional complications like a big construction loan with a lender who underwrote a developer and not the new buyer. You have a lot of contracts with general contractors and subcontractors that are really dependent on who is the owner of the building. And then finally, you have what's called broken priority of title. Title companies have a hard time transferring properties when there's the potential for subcontractors to lien them. So all of those factors you know, create a little bit more risk. And because there's more risk, that means we have a lower valuation. We go out and have a third party. Uh, do a full analysis of our valuation when we think we've hit that bottom. Uh, typically for ground up development, it's around 30%. We've seen anywhere from 25 to 45, but 30% is kind of a good number to think about. Uh, that happens right after we start construction 
continues throughout the duration of construction. And once we hit that certificate of occupancy, that's when we start to get that higher valuation again. A different way to look at it, if you invested a dollar, and again, this is not a representation of our fund, this is just an example uh, to discuss. But if an investor invested a dollar, we start construction, that dollar is now valued at 70 cents. So now you have to pay taxes, but instead of 40 cents, it's 28 cents. They're just assuming a 40% tax bracket, right? Um, just to remember, everybody invested a dollar, then they came out of pocket and paid 28 cents in taxes when they did the conversion. Again, just an example, but assuming an annual 10% growth rate for four years, a dollar turns into a dollar 46. And you can see a dollar 46, that's more than the original investment plus uh, what you paid in taxes. That's kind of how we're looking at it. And also, of course, all of these profits tax-free because now your money is in a Roth. And in a Roth, not only is this you know, investment a tax-free investment, but every investment you make in the future is a tax-free investment. So that's great. Uh, some details about this fund, $67 million, minimum investment size, 50 million. Um, we are a 506C, we do anticipate a three to five year time horizon, and we're doing multifamily. Uh, let's talk specifically about um, the project. So uh, we looked at a map of downtown San Jose. It's a little bit of a different way to look at it. Our project is located right here. Of course, we're building that hotel project right across the street and the senior living right next door. Um, Google, again, 300 yards away. This is in downtown West. Uh, We've built a lot of the projects surrounding this project. In fact, on this map, you can see uh, all these dark blue squares. These are uh, other multifamily comparable projects, you know, class A, you know, built recently. Uh, ones with circles around them. These are projects that Urban Catalyst Partners built as the lead developer. And so we found out when we made this slide, we built five out of the 12 major comparables for this. So a lot of experience building multifamily. And here's what some of our projects here at Urban Catalyst have looked like. So you can see, Really good looking buildings. Um, here's what our project looks like. It is a 272 unit building. It is called Aquino. Again, very similar to our hotel that we're building right across the street. This is an eight story building. It's very typical unit size, unit mix, primarily studios ones and twos with a couple of three bedrooms. Uh, we also have some really great amenity spaces, including this podium deck for our residents, a nice rooftop deck. Uh, some office space on the ground floor, and then this is just for our tenants. Uh, and then also we have a hidden door with a speakeasy. It's always kind of a fun thing to have uh, in our buildings. We've had a lot of success with those. Uh, we talked about this before, right, which is the multifamily market. I mentioned we have the highest occupancy rates in the country. Uh, we build less units than anywhere else in the country. Uh, from May to May of last year, we had the highest rental growth in the country, and a lot of third parties are showing and projecting that San Jose will have the highest rent growth, um, higher than anywhere else in the country over the next five and 10 years. So uh, again, the multifamily market really strong here in Silicon Valley. And we already talked about us as partners, but to get to our timeline slide, um, this project, you know, we're raising $67 million for this fund. It's a one-year fundraise. We plan to start construction. As soon as we complete the fundraise, we already own the land. We already have full approvals to build the building. We're halfway through construction documents. This project should be shovel ready in April of next year. So we could, we're going to start as soon as our fundraising hits the right mark so that we can uh, build the building. We already have some term sheets from senior debt lenders with pretty good terms, at least good enough for us to uh, pull the trigger to build the building. Construction takes two years. You know, during this time, that's when we have that low valuation. Kind of the cool part about two-year construction timelines, it spans three calendar years. So that allows investors, once we hit that lower valuation, we send out that notification, they can choose to do their conversions in 2024, 2025, or 2026. Um, whatever is the benefit to them based upon their own personal tax situations, they can do a little bit each year. They can do it all in one year. They can really choose how they want to do it. Then we have about a year of lease up followed by a sale of the asset. So the goal, build the building, lease it up, sell it, give the money back to the investors uh, tax-free. As long as they've chosen to invest uh, retirement money through an IRA and then done their own Roth IRA conversion when we hit that low valuation point. Again, bonus units, you know, very similar to how the other fund worked. We have our time incentive credit, 
Uh, we only launched this fund really in August. So uh, here we are in December, we saw 4% bonus units. Again, if you buy $100 worth of our units, you get $104 worth of our units uh, in December. Uh, multiple ventures, if you invest in more than one of our funds, 4.5% bonus units. And in this fund, we have a $50,000 minimum. 200000 is where bonus units start. They go all the way up to a million dollars, 9%. And these three categories add together to get your total bonus units. And Jimmy, that's the end of my presentation. Um, we went through Opportunity Zone Fund 2 and the great projects we have in that fund, as well as our uh, urban or UC Multifamily Equity One LLC, which we call UCME, uh, which is gives investors the potential to do IRA to Roth IRA conversions. Fantastic! Uh, really clever structure with the uh, with the Roth IRA conversion mechanism. There oh. makes total sense to me. We had a, a few questions to get to. Uh, we're running a little long, but we can we can go for a few more minutes at least to see if we can get these questions answered. Murdy asks, "How does the RMD required minimum distribution?" come into play if we invest IRA funds into your project? And just to, to clarify one thing, I don't believe Roth IRAs have a required minimum distribution because they're after tax, but uh, regular IRAs would. <clears throat> if somebody were to invest a, a, a traditional IRA funds into your project and they do hit that, I think it's 73 years of age, they are starting, they need to start taking required minimum distributions, um, basically a percentage that factors in their life expectancy and it's it's provided in a table by the IRS. But suffice to say, they have to take a certain percentage out every year starting at age 73. How does that, how does that uh, come into play for, for this type of investment? So this is a, a real, um, real personal question, right? As far as how this investor wants to do their investment. Mm -hmm. You know, there are requirements by the IRS of what the minimum distributions are. And as you mentioned, Jimmy Roth IRAs, I agree with you that uh, I don't think they have that minimum distribution. They do have other requirements, but this is really a question to ask an advisor or ask, you know, a, a real estate attorney or a investment attorney, uh, your accountant. This is a kind of a different question that you should ask us. Good. Um, Yadiel asked a, a while back, I think while you were talking about office, uh, are you in an office right now? He's curious. Yes, I am in my office. Urban Catalyst, we have been back in the office 100% of the time since we were legally allowed to be. That was uh, June 30th of 2021. Very good. Um, when did I visit you guys? I visited you guys right around that time, I think it was. You did, Jimmy. About, you came about out a couple years ago. And they, I, can, I can attest they were back in the office. Their whole team was in there. They had a, they had a few dozen people in there that day. You had an investor group come in too, if I recall you know, correctly. We've been we've been providing free lunches to our uh, employees, and that has turned out to be very successful. They're very happy with our lunches. And very healthy too. Very good. Uh, we had another question here. Uh, this one's also from Murdy. Actually, he asked, "Do you have uh, do you have options to include Roth IRA investing also?" So I think you I think you went through that part. Um, th if somebody yeah. already has a Roth IRA, can they come in? They, they absolutely can. I mean, this is a very traditional real estate equity fund. The kind of the only real difference between us and the very traditional ones would be we accept retirement money and we can accept up to 100% of our fund as retirement money. So you can invest in IRA, you can invest in Roth IRA. Now, kind of the structure of the fund really lends itself to folks investing their IRA and then doing the conversion to the Roth IRA. But that isn't to say that you couldn't invest just regular money or Roth IRA money if you wanted to. Our returns you know, they line up pretty well with what a traditional uh, ground of development fund uh, would return. Yeah. And just to just to kind of uh, clarify or to reiterate what Eric said and, and why I, I personally think that this is a, a really cool structure. Um, oftentimes, a Roth IRA conversion is looked at as a great tax savings plan, uh, it, particularly if you happen to be in a lower income bracket in any particular year. Uh, working up toward your retirement years. But the, the issue is when you convert from a traditional to a Roth, you owe a huge tax bill. You basically owe taxes on the amount that you convert into a Roth IRA because the the traditional IRA money is pre-tax. So you 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 are taxed on it as ordinary income as you distribute it every year. So when you make that conversion, you owe a big tax bill. Now, what, what Urban Catalyst has done here is they say, well, okay, put in your, your pre-tax traditional IRA dollars 
into our real estate fund will actually drive the fair market value of it down because it'll it'll be under construction and we'll show that the fair market value is actually dipped down and that's the time to make the conversion because now you're paying 70 cents on the dollar essentially again that was just an example uh do i have do i am i understand this right eric because i actually you, think it's you, you absolutely are really cool what you guys have done here you know it's it's kind of interesting right because this devaluation that occurs in funds that build ground up development projects it, it, it just happens inherently. It just happens mm -hmm. every time. Uh, in fact, yesterday I had a call with one of my fund one, my opportunity zone fund one investors. And he says, how come I'm looking at my statement and it's showing that it's devalued? And I said, because that happens in ground up development funds. In fact, we even have a white paper describing what the J curve is so that you can understand this isn't that we're losing money. It's that we have a lower valuation for a variety of reasons. It's just which can be which can be a very good thing, and is, and it's especially a good thing if you're doing a Roth IRA conversion. At that That's time. right. Go so on. For this fund, we structured it intentionally to be able to take advantage of that devaluation. So it it's taking the it's taking what usually we have to explain and really taking advantage of it. Excellent. Um, we had another question come in here asking. Uh, hi, I wondered if any of the UC Urban Catalyst offerings would be a good fit to offset current non-capital gains income, either for 23 or for 24. So, so real estate can oftentimes be used to offset income uh, with depreciation. Um, but but it, 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 is that right, Eric? Or what else might you add there? Yeah, I mean, to offset uh, current income. I would say our funds aren't really designed to offset income, besides that just like you said, that we inherently have passive losses associated with our projects. Um, our funds, you know, the, the two that we talked about today, one of them is really focused on capital gains and how to, uh, you know, have tax advantages uh, with that capital gains event. And the other one is really focused on how to take advantage of devaluation to do an IRA to Roth IRA conversion. So I would say we don't really have offerings that don't, that do anything you know, extra special for you besides what traditional investment into real estate does. But yeah, even, but, but even still just any real estate investment, real estate as an asset class has these inherent advantages built in. And, and the, the primary way to do that would be through depreciation. Um, best part, by the way, about opportunity zone investing is that there's no depreciation recapture when you uh, divest of your uh, shares 10 plus years down the line. Give me, it's, it's like, you know, a lot about opportunities. <laughs> I do, Eric. I think I've, I've somewhat <laughs> accidentally become an expert over the years. Uh, let's see. This one might be repetitive. I haven't read this one yet. Let me see. This might be the last one that I see coming in. Um, and then we can kind of call it a day. This one asks, without converting to a Roth IRA, how would you structure into your investment and still meet the RMD requirement several years from now? So um, again, I, I think Eric would, would advise you to consult with your, your uh, tax advisor, your CPA on any personal investment decisions or any personal questions like this, because it does depend on your age when you are going to hit 73. Uh, by the way, that law keeps changing. It used to be 72 and now it's 73. Maybe it'll be 74 in a few years. Um but um, I, I guess what, one way possibly to meet the RMD, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Like I haven't really done all the math or research on this, but um, th that UCME will be spitting off income at some point down the road. Is that right? Well, UCME is really designed not to spit off any income. Okay. We're designed to just sell the asset as soon as possible. Hmm. Uh, we don't want to hit uh, UBTI, which would... Uh, be a type of income that is taxable even inside of a Roth. And that mm -hmm. typically comes from income from buildings. So the way that we typically design our capital stack when we build our buildings is we typically design it so that the lender, our construction lender, will sweep all proceeds from rent during the lease-up period. Then once the lease-up period occurs, we'll continue to sweep proceeds until we sell the building or refinance it. Uh, gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so yeah, for all these questions about you know, how, how do I get my IRA funds into this urban catalyst fund? Uh, and, and what do I do about the RMDs? You know, Eric and I would both urge you to consult with your professional advisors, your, your investment advisor or your CPA. Um, Eric, I think there are probably some members on your team as well that could help steer them in the right direction or, or, or give them, um, some words of advice one way or another. Um, if, if anybody on the call today, 
is interested and wants to learn more about Urban Catalyst, the platform, your OZ fund, UCME, where can they go to learn more? What's the best way to get in touch with you and your team? Best way to get in touch with us is to visit us at urbancatalyst.com. Uh, if you form fill, our folks will call you within 24 hours. Very good. And are there uh, tax advisors that you guys like to recommend that you work with? Uh, we do have advisors uh, that we recommend if folks are interested in talking with an advisor. Okay. Yeah. We just so we just we just had a question about that. So please please do get in touch with with Eric. Head to urbancatalyst.com to learn more. There's a contact form there, and they can help steer you in the right direction. Um, Eric, we're a little bit over time here, but I think it was well worth it. Uh, I learned a lot. Thank you for joining us today on today's webinar, a super webinar, uh, I dubbed it, uh, co-hosted by Urban Catalyst and Wealth Channel. And thank you all who attended today. Eric, again, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Great talking with you again. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you.